exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them out of the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Then the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Everybody said amen. amen. Thank you, Phil. It's a great day to be able to praise God. And Justin, thank you so much for the songs today. Your Wednesday night has paid off. So I think you can see a lot of work's been done on some of those, especially because those were the first time they've been led here on a Sunday morning. So that's always a good thing to have them go that well. Jesus built a temple is what we're going to talk about in just a minute. But I want you to know that uh, I should warn you, I guess, or maybe cause you to rejoice uh, I'm going to be gone for the next two weeks. So <laughs> whichever way you want to take that news, I'm going to be gone on vacation. Nancy has already gone to see the grand girls, and uh, we're going to have a chance to take a trip and to get away and uh, go on a cruise to Alaska and see some good things. So we will miss you in the heat. <laughs> and feel blessed. <laughs> Uh, but it's going to be a good time, and Joshua's going to preach next week, and then Joel the week after, so it's, you're, you're going to have some great services here. Uh, today is also an LTC meeting, especially if uh, you have kids from third grade to senior high. That's always one of the big things that the church does, and so be aware of that meeting. It's in room 105. Dallas said it's short. Yeah, we'll see. We want to talk today about uh, places where we meet God, because we've been talking so far about things that Jesus built, and I think it's interesting to watch it where God does meet people. I, I think today we almost want to say, well, God's everywhere, and God will meet me anywhere, and that's just not true. Uh, yes, God's everywhere, and you can pray to him anywhere, but for him to come and meet you, don't think so. That is different than just God being everywhere and you praying. I hope you realize that. It's not the same thing. Because God does make special appointments where he comes and meets people. Like the top of a mountain when he comes down in fire and smoke to deliver the law to the Israelites. That's a special appointment. So do we get any of those kind of times, any of that special appointment? Well, let me just give you what happens. Uh, first time God met people was in the garden. I mean, that's the basic, simplest place where he meets them. After that, we see that there are altars that are put up, and so those are altars to God. God has the incense or has the sacrifice, and so he perhaps smells that. The next place that God seems to meet is in the tabernacle. Tabernacle looks something like this. I'm not sure about their scale on it. But uh, it was a very special place that was built to exact specifications where God would meet with them. And the reason it looked like this is because it was portable. It needed to be mobile. They, people wanted to know, or God wanted the people to know, that he was always with them. And so they carried, literally, the place where God was going to meet them. And so this is kind of what it looked like. Uh, there's the altar on the outside, and 
the uh, altar of incense and the laver, and then you go inside, and there is the holy place. And then in the back, in the inside of the inside, is the holy of holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was, and that's where the mercy seat of God was, and that's where God literally sat. He says, I will be in there. And the glory of God came down and filled that tabernacle. And it was something they could visibly see. And so God was among his people. He wanted them to know that he was right there. That he had that special bond, that special place with them. He also, it didn't go so well. And so there was a tent of meeting that was just outside the camp where he met with Moses at times. And then the next place that we see happening is called the temple. Solomon actually built the temple. David wanted to. But the uh, taller structure is actually the inside of what would have been that holy place and holy of holies. It was laid out very much the same way. But there are temple courts. And God said, I will be there because you're no longer moving around. And if they had been a mobile nation, then certainly they would not have built a temple in a permanent place. But he said, you're not going to be that anymore. You're going to be in a certain place. And so God is giving them security by saying, you're going to be in that place, and I'm going to meet you there. And the priest would be able to come in and offer sacrifices on that. And then the holy of holies, the high priest would go in once a year to offer the sacrifice or make atonement for the uh, sins of the people on the Day of Atonement. And so as you look at that, it's one of those amazing places. If you go in and look inside, it was overlaid with gold, the whole thing. You have the cherubim, the seraphim. You're not able to see the, the division there, but this is one way a person looked at it. It was a permanent place, and yet it didn't solve all the problems. And that was because of the corruption of the people. They didn't care, and it didn't matter anymore. It wasn't a problem with the building. The building was fine, but the people were not. And the last place that Jesus is going to build is his church and a temple within that church. I want you to realize that those may be separate things or that we may need to talk about them as separate things. They are very much together. But I want you to realize those because we need to be able to speak about them in a different way. And so the three things that Jesus builds that we've been saying is Jesus first made disciples, built disciples. And he did that by calling people to come and follow him. And he said, I want you to learn from me. I want you to be able to see what I do. And as they followed him, they were able to understand what his ministry was about, and he was expecting them to be part of that ministry and part of that work. It wasn't just a matter of come around and watch me because I like a crowd watching me. It was a matter of coming and being my disciple because I want you to be like me. And someday I want you to be leading other disciples. And so that's what he was calling them to. And he takes those disciples then and he builds a church. He says, I will build my church. We looked at this last week. And that's one of the things that he intended to do. And the church was a great, glorious place. It was a place where they all came together. And you can see the day of Pentecost and all the things that happened on that day. How the people came together. They repented of their sins. They were baptized into Christ and they are disciples already as people who come into this new place of, of being part of the church. But it wasn't so much a building. They didn't really have a building. In fact, they used the temple, not, not so much the inner part, because it wasn't that many of them that were priests uh, in a Jewish sense. But he says they used the portico. They used the porch outside. Let me see if I can go back one. So the courtyard around there was where they would meet for church. It was a place big enough. It was a place that would hold. It was, and, and you can see a great thing being accomplished by this church that he built. And he wanted a church that would take care of each other. 
and do things for each other and encourage each other and lift each other up, that would be able to teach, that they would be able to learn from each other and learn of Jesus and all that he had commanded. They would need to learn to love God and to love each other. And so it would be very, very important for this church to be that group of people that, that did those things to each other and with each other. They would live out the fullness of God, as Ephesians 1 talks about. And then Jesus built one more thing. Yeah, he built a temple. So let me just ask you, where do we go to meet God? Well, hopefully you came here this morning, and that's the reason why you came here, because he builds a temple. And I want you to see how this whole thing works out. Now, if you were in Ken's class this morning, he has actually already preached this sermon. Thank you, Ken. So you're going to get a second version of exactly what he did. His was on the book of Haggai, and if you read the book of Haggai, it is this sermon. I wish he'd taught the class the week before, and I could have just repeated what he said. But uh, we come from different angles to get to exactly the same point. The passage I want to share with you is from John chapter 2 that Phil has read for us, and Jesus is very upset at the things he finds in the temple. Mind you, he's not upset at the building. He is upset at the people. He is upset at what's going on in his temple. He is upset at the buying and selling on the outside in the court because it changes the minds of the people who walk in. And he doesn't want the minds of the people changed so that they're walking in thinking, boy, I sure got cheated on that sheep. He, he doesn't want them thinking about the commerce and all the other things. They've come to be able to meet God and to worship God and to offer a sacrifice to God, and that's not what they're able to find here. And so he's very upset with all of this, and he comes in and he takes the whip and he drives them all out, overturns the tables and the money changers, and he says, you're not going to make my father's house a house of trade. So he's very upset with this, and of course that kind of disturbs everybody, and they say, well, uh, I don't think I'd ask this, but they ask, well, what sign do you show for doing this? Because they take him to be a prophet. And he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Well, he's standing in the temple, so destroy this temple, meaning the place where we're standing, and I'll build it in three days. And they're saying, no, no, it took a lot longer than that to build this temple. And what he's meaning is destroy this temple, and in three days it'll be raised up again. So he's really talking about the temple of his body, that that would be destroyed. Because the temple where they're standing was going to be destroyed for good. AD 70, it's completely taken down. There is nothing left of it. There is the spot where it used to stand. But... That temple does not exist, and the Jews do not have a temple to this day other than the temple of Jesus Christ. That's what he claims to be. He says, I will build my temple. I will raise it up again. It isn't the building that's the problem. It's the people. And Jesus declares by his death on the cross that he will be raised. The first temple is the temple of his body that would be raised again. In fact, this is the thing that convicts him, this very statement, because they bring that up again in Matthew 26, and at the end as they are, are basically cursing him and saying, yeah, you promised you'd build that temple and raise it up in, in three days. We haven't seen you. Come down from the cross and show us you can do that. The second is the temple of his body, meaning us, of his church. Because that's really what he was trying to build, is through this resurrection, through this crucifixion and resurrection, we are that new temple. We are that the part of his body that has been raised up where people are able to meet God, where they are all able to come together. And I think we really miss this one a lot. Because the current trend is for us to be a very socially involved group of people. And church is more about being community church. 
That's really what it's all about is, you know, as long as you have a good rapport in the community, and we do a lot of things with the community. We have food bags that we hand out, and so there is food for people. We have uh, things that we have done for teachers and for education as goodwill to the community. There are several things that we do along this line. The Harvest Festival is going to be an outreach to try and get people from the community in. And so there are a number of different things that we do. I know there's a light rail meeting coming up on Tuesday that they're going to come and say, here's our light rail. Well, that has nothing to do with us, but we're going to let them use our building because it's a community outreach, and if they get in the first time, maybe they'll come in a second time. But that's really not what Jesus is trying to say. Let's be community conscious, and therefore people will like us. They'll all love us because... We're a good community resource. That's not what Jesus was trying to build. Now that does seem to be what a lot of people are trying to build. A place of fellowship, a place of friendship, a place where people can be happy. We'll all get along. We'll have activities to do. Let's plan macrame and crafts and, and just, you know, how do you cook noodles or whatever it is that you want to do. And we'll teach everybody how to do everything and we'll just have this great community of people, and that's really not what Jesus was intending. That's more church. And yes, there was fellowship with church, and yes, there is a great amount of things that the people did together as they ate together in their homes and as they were part of each other, and the fellowship is hugely important, and I'm not trying to play that down. That was last week. This week, it's just not far enough. There is more to the story because he also came to say, I build my temple. You raise it up. This is what it's going to be like. We want to be able to have a, a great thing with God. So we focus on, I think a lot of times today, people focus on the physical programs with a lot of activities and supplies and families that get along together. If we could just solve the divorce issue, the divorce plague that goes on in our world today, wouldn't that be great? Where children could all grow up in a loving home and everything would be good. That's all good, but it's not the end of what he wanted. What he wants is a spiritual temple, and that's just a little bit harder to define. I wish you guys would have been in Ken's class, then you'd see this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you want to turn with me there. Paul begins by talking to the Corinthians and saying, you guys are not very spiritual. That's always a good way to start a conversation, isn't it? You guys are not very spiritual, and so you're probably not even going to get what I'm about to tell you. But I want to tell you this. Uh, and you might have a very hard time understanding it because there's a lot of jealousy and strife and, and things that are going on among you that you, you're just not going to get this. And then he begins to compare, here's what God is doing when he built his church and what Jesus is doing as he builds his church from heaven. He says, I came in and I planted. Apollos came after me and he watered. And those are the first two preachers that showed up in Corinth. And he talks about his work, about how he planted a church and Apollos watered and God gave the growth to this church. And so he compares it to plants, to a field, to a building. And so he describes his work. Well, down in verse 10, I want you to look with me. He talks about the growth of this. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds a foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what a sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only so as through fire. 
And so as Paul says, by grace, I was able to, be, to build on the foundation, to lay the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. He's the first thing. He's the most important thing. That's really what it's all about. And I want you to realize that there is no other foundation than that. And so he says, I tried to plant that in the hearts of all the people. Uh, that's what church is all about, is being able to follow Jesus Christ. That's who we are. We are disciples. And then he says, other people build on it. And we all have different talents and different gifts and different ways in which we're able to build. And so he's talking about building this church, and he's saying we all have different parts into it. But there's even a reward for the people who would build in this church and for the things that people would do. And that's all of you, the things that you would do that help make this church what it should be and what it can be. But what is it that we're really building? Is it just a community center? He said, no, it should look like a temple. And that's the best I know how to say it. It's a place to come for help, a place to come for learning, a place to find Jesus and to learn about salvation. It's a place where you meet God, and it's where worship takes place. Because as he talks about this building all the way down, then the very next verse is this. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So all the work is making them into the temple of God, the place where God's spirit dwells, where he is individually and group connected with us. Realize it comes in both ways. In chapter 6, he's going to say, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, meaning your body. Here he means the church. As we collectively come together, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God is among us. It, it, he is here with us. It is that gathered body of Christ that does praises to God. He says, don't destroy that temple. He says, those are God's people. God's temple is holy, meaning we are holy. It's a God's place of praise that we would praise him. God is making a place where love and grace are able to be shown. And one of the verses I just remember from Psalm 22 and verse 3, he says, God is enthroned on the praise of Israel. The passage is all about Jesus and about his crucifixion, but as he, he talks about all of those different things, that phrase stands out, God is enthroned on the praise of Israel. And I think today God is enthroned on the praise of his people. That's exactly what he wants it is when we come together to worship him, there's something that happens in that group of people that are something that different. Jesus joins in the middle. God is here in that temple. It's a house where we gather together and God is glorified and we can see his majesty. And grace and blessings are given. Temple is the fulfillment of church and what church should be. It fulfills the purpose of church. It's not just about being able to fill physical needs and, well, if you run out of money, too bad. The temple is the where the world is brought to God. It's where you can actually be in his presence. It's one of those special places where God says, I will come and I will meet with my people. And there are not very many of those. You realize throughout history, there's only been a handful. And today you are one of those places. That that's where you sit. Where they can see the love of God. Where they can see his majesty in the eyes of people who would praise him. Where they can see physical and spiritual meet together. It's where praise comes true. It's not just words about him. It's where communion is taken, the renewal of a covenant. And it's more than just juice and crackers. It's much more than that. It's the renewing of a whole covenant with God. It's done in a memory of what he has done for us. It's like 
the woman that lives at your house or the woman who does all the cooking and cleaning and stuff at your house, who is that? It could just be somebody you hired, right? It could be. And then if they don't work out, you get a new one. Or it could be a wife. What's the difference? If you're married and you don't know, you're in trouble. <laughs> There's a huge difference. One is just somebody you pay. The other is somebody that you love and somebody that loves you. And there is a huge difference in that. And what an amazing thing is. Now, you may like your housekeeper, but it's not the same as being the wife in the house that has that special place of love. And that's what God's trying to say. And I don't want just people who keep the pews in nice order. I want that love that's expressed as you sing praise to me. I want that love that's shown to each other. I want the way in which you're able to show an expression to God of here's what I think of you. And we do that when we sing and when we pray and when we come to worship God. This is what it is. And God says, I'm watching, I'm listening. Those are one of those times where I'm going to focus on you. It's not that we said something and God goes, what did you say? It's the time where God says, I'm going to specifically meet you there. Paul describes it in Ephesians chapter 2 as well, as he seems to want this point to get across. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of the saints so remember, and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You see, he started in chapter 2 talking about we were terrible, awful people and we were so far away from God and there was nothing that could be done and yet God in his mercy showed and gave grace. And it's the main passage that talks so much about the grace of God and the result of the grace of God being given to his people to bring about salvation is worship in his temple. Read the whole chapter. Don't just stop at verse 10. That's what everyone does as we talk about this salvation we have. It's, it's through the grace of God. It's freely been given as a gift. And, and then we get down to that good works might be done in 10. And boy, we're ready to quit by then. He said, don't you realize I've built you into a temple where that praise can be given to me? Jesus is the cornerstone. You're no longer strangers and aliens. We are members of God's household. We are built into this dwelling of God. It is the result of grace that builds a temple. And the whole structure grows into a holy temple built together by the Spirit of God. It fills that empty place where God should be. Because I think we still have that. We become a disciple and realize there's still more because we need those friendships and relationships in church. And we have to have those as we come in and so we get to know a few people. And, and we're able to know them and we sit and we go to the class and we go, eh, it's good, but... But when you connect with God in worship, he says, now you've reached what church was supposed to be about. It's about that personal relationship with God. It's not just a community of church, but also a worship of God. It connects people to his majesty. You see, at the tabernacle, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of that temple, of that, well, at the temple, Jesus tore that veil in two between the holy place and the holy of holies. It was the next step in a relationship with God. He allows us to walk into the holy of holies where he is. The people who hunger and thirst for righteousness have now become priests that serve in the presence of God. And God makes all of us as priests 
it isn't like you have to go through somebody else, but if you look at First Peter and things that we don't have any time to go to, he says, you're all made into priests. And it's what God has done to be able to serve in his temple because that's the place where priests belong. As Jesus clears the temple the second time before his death, there is twice. He said, my house is to be a house of prayer. And it is. Let me share with you the passage where he brings that from. Is out of Isaiah 56 and verses 5. He says, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument to the name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister him, to love the name of the Lord, will be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain to make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the people. And the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. You realize that passage is us. We're the others outside. We're the foreigners. We're the ones who have a covenant with him. And he says, I'll bring you to my holy mountain and I'm going to make you joyful. What an incredible thing. If you look at Haggai that Ken did, he said, you realize that their crops were not working, the people weren't doing well because they quit building the temple. And he says, I'm not blessing you anymore. Go back and build my temple. And when they do, they're able to enjoy the blessing of God. And it's the same thing that would happen to us today. Is that he says, I want you to be my temple. I want you to build together as each one of you is being fitted and formed into it. It's more than just a community church. It's the temple of God. The place where God makes us holy. Where God blesses. Where we come into his presence. Where we... Behold his majesty. And nowhere is it expressed better than in song. We give praise to the greatest and the most holy one. You have to be here. You can't just sit at home and watch it. It's not a video. You have to be here to be part of it as this group comes together to be able to praise God. And that's what I'd like for us to do right now. Because that is the temple of God in action. Justin, would you come lead us? As the mountains around Jerusalem, would you stand? so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem. So the Lord surrounds his people, surround us, Lord, surround us, O Lord. We need to be in your presence, surround us. Lord, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Surround us, Lord.
Lord, surround us, Lord, surround us, O Lord. We need to be in your presence, surround us, Lord. Surround us, Lord. Please be seated. One of the great things about being God's temple, his people, is that um, he gives us the ability to come to him and humble ourselves um, at times that we need and recognize who he is um, in our life and what he's done for us. Um, Tawana Carter had wrote to us and said that, brothers and sisters, she has sinned and asked God for uh, forgiveness. She asked the church to forgive her. Um, she mentioned the last year has been overwhelming, um, that she's placed loyalties and people that were uh, not the people of God, and uh, she's wanted to thank uh, Brother Joshua for